Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, in New York City. We are all the way in the very south of Brooklyn, and this is a neighborhood that is not mentioned too much in the travel guides, nor even in most, it's not even the radar of most New Yorkers themselves. However, for this journey through this neighborhood, I want to convince you otherwise because there are so many wonderful secrets all around here. Types of landmarks you really won't see anywhere else in the city. Let's explore Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. My name is Ariel and this is Urbanist. Let's explore the secrets of Bay Ridge. Right now we are viewing the Verrazano Bridge one of the longest suspension bridges in the entire world. One of the longest ones in all the United States of America. It crosses between Brooklyn and Staten Island and it's an icon of this neighborhood. And right next to it is a cannon. A huge, huge cannon. This cannon is a 20 inch Rodman cannon. One of the largest built in military history here in the United States of America. But what is it doing here? Well, one for one particular reason. However, before we start, where is Bay Ridge? Bay Ridge, you have to go all the way to South Brooklyn. And it's marked right there in the red line on that area of Brooklyn. We are in John Paul Jones Park, which is adjacent to Fort Hamilton. Fort Hamilton is a military base. And these were the views of Bay Ridge. Bay Ridge was established by the Dutch in 1657 as New Utrecht. It was a village within New Utrecht, one of the five main towns or cities of Brooklyn during the Dutch era. This is a depiction of what the Dutch might have seen along with the early British. So I say southern tip. And yeah, Coney Island people might consider the southern tip. It's, it's more of a matter of semantics, but we are in what traditionally was always called South Brooklyn. So welcome everyone. Let me know, have you been to Bay Ridge before or have you heard of it? Let me know, I'm very curious. Have you even heard of Bay Ridge? It's popular for one specific film. A film where a very iconic scene happens at Verrazano Bridge. Let me know what that film is, and let's continue on with our tour. This is the 20-inch Rodman Cannon. This is one of the largest cannons ever built in the United States of America towards the Civil War era. But why did they build a huge cannon like this with 20 inch cannonballs? 20 inch cannonballs is maybe four or five times larger than most cannonballs. The reason for that is during the Civil War and right after it, America was still afraid that European powers might come over and invade. And it wasn't totally unprecedented because there were rumors of the Germans align with the Mexicans to take over the United States of America. Only until recently they actually discovered actual plans from the Kaiser during that time where he wanted to blockade all American cities uh, on the eastern seaboard, specifically Boston, Philly, and New York. And that's how he would take over the United States. Also, we fought border wars with Mexico during those times. So the U.S. wanted to make a show of power on their harbors. And that show of power on their harbors was going to be the Rodman Cannon, developed by a Union artillery officer by the last name of Rodman. And this was supposed to skip on the water, so it won't be aimed directly at a ship. If it were aimed directly at a ship, it would tear through an ironclad ship. However, it was meant to skip on the water and then hit the ship on the harbor. So look at that. Let me show you one more time how huge, and here's the cannonballs. 
However, this never seen the light of battle. It was used as a demonstration various times, but never fully blown upon any enemy ship. Because the Kaiser from Germany never decided to invade, luckily. Now, one thing about this cannon is that in history, European and American history, they tried to build cannons this big before. However, they usually would explode on themselves. A famous general from the Navy or admiral from the Navy died because during a demonstration of another large cannon, it cracked here and exploded onto the crowd. This one was the only, the only functional mega cannon that was built in America. Here's another, here's a photo of Rodman. That was the guy who built here. And Fort Hamilton's right nearby. We're gonna walk this way. And let me show you the Rodman cannon. Rodman cannons, there's not that many of them, uh, but they are stationed, this one is in Alexandria, Virginia, which is right by Washington, DC. And there is another one in Fort Totten here in Queens, which I explored last year. Here is an obelisk in honor of the naval forces that fought in the Great War, which is World War I. Obelisks are all around New York City. And I love all the pigeons. Obelisks are home for pigeons, basically, nowadays. All right, let's walk through the park and make our way to our second stop. It says, to the glory of God and everlasting remembrance of the Dover Patrol, 1914 to 1919. They died that we might live. May we be worthy of their sacrifice. Strangely enough, the word mega cannon does not pop up in everyday conversations, says. Donald, I think most of the things I cover don't pop up in everyday conversations. Love your shirt and your mask. Very colorful. Thank you so much. I appreciate the compliment, Denise. Hello, Cheryl. Cheryl, thank you so much for the stars. I think Cindy also loves stars as well. Thank you, Cindy. I appreciate your support. So this is John Paul Jones. Not that much here beyond those two landmarks. So we're going to crisscross our way through Bay Ridge. Hello, Donna. Nice to see you here. So one people, one person got it right. Darren, Saturday Night Fever is the iconic film that took place in the neighborhood of Bay Ridge and the neighborhood right next door called Bensonhurst. So two neighborhoods right next to each other. John Paul Jones also fought off the coast of Carcifragus, Northern Ireland. Oh, thank you for letting me know. I didn't know who John Paul Jones was. I thought he was one of the band members of Led Zeppelin. I'm just joking. There is a band member called uh, John Paul Jones, but uh, glad, thank you for letting us know that it was named after a man who fought off Northern Ireland. Hello, Natalie. Hello, Betty. Hello, Donna. Hello, Judy. Never heard of the bridge, Cheryl? Oh, cool. We're going to see better views of the bridge. Here we're seeing the approach of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. That's the official name. And here we are approaching a military base, Fort Hamilton, named after Alexander Hamilton. And there's another cannon in front of it. So, U.S. Army, Fort Hamilton. This is the main gate. I wish I could go in. They do have, like, a tiny museum that's open, but since it's pandemic time, it's closed. Sean, how's life? Life is good. I enjoy walking in the city again. Let me know how you're doing. Hope you're able to open up your haunted houses by October. Carol, what valuable history lesson. Thank you very much for doing that. Lucas from Czech Republic. I was going to New York City this year, but USA, USA is closed. USA is closed and also for us, 
almost the entire world is closed, which is a grand shame. I know how you feel, because I wanted to travel as well. Hello, Susan. Hello, Phil. Bay Ridge. Where does this name come from? Well, I showed you a photo earlier of a beautiful view on the shore. However, that shore is elevated because it's a huge ridge. It's a glacier ridge. And we're going to walk through here. Vicky, you were here last summer. Oh, cool. So the approach to the Verrazano's is huge and it connects directly to the Belt Parkway. So it's an entire interstate system. And here are some of the houses in Bay Ridge. Now, Bay Ridge doesn't have your typical Brooklyn architecture. There's very few brownstones here. What Bay Ridge does have is an architectural movement that isn't so well known in New York. It's a little bit more well known in California, but it's very well known in the UK, specifically in England. This was the arts and crafts movement. Started by two men. Oh. John Ruskin and William Morris. These two men during the 1850s, 60s, and 70s saw a world being rapidly mechanized. And this church that we're seeing here is John, St. John Episcopal Church. Episcopal, this is their sigil. Not to be confused with St. John the Divine. This is a different St. John's. And John Ruskin and Willie Morris saw their world being rapidly mechanized. And as it was being rapidly mechanized, there was less emphasis on craftsmanship, on artistry, and more emphasis on mass production. So a lot of architecture was starting to become very modern. There was the Art Nouveau mo movement that was kind of wild and out there. But aside from that, a lot of buildings were starting to look all the same. A lot of furniture was starting to look all the same. Craftsmen started losing their jobs and they wanted to make something different. So they started the arts and crafts movement, which did use machinery, but embraced artistry. Thus, they had their craftsmen that were architects, builders, contractors, furniture makers, wallpaper designers, have them master the machines. And thus, uniting craftsmanship with the state-of-the-art technology. And this is one of the very, very few arts and crafts buildings in all of New York. And we're going to see another one. But this is absolutely gorgeous. And I love this church. It's, I think it's closed, unfortunately, because this has a huge for sale sign. Let me zoom in a little bit better so we can see. How's my camera so steady? I'm using the DJI Osmo Mobile 3, which is a gimbal. The church is not protected. One thing is that most of Bay Ridge does, it doesn't have a historic district. There's only one historic district and there are no major landmark buildings. This church is not protected. If I could buy this church, I would. It looks so gorgeous. But yeah, it's for sale and not protected. One marker of the arts and crafts movement, which is a style of architecture that is also new to me because growing up in New York, you don't really see this. If you live in Pasadena, California, you might see it a little bit more and you might see it a lot more in England. One marker is stone. They use unco like uncut stone, stones that are naturally shaped uh, from when they are digged up. So they're not made into perfect cubes or um, 
little rectangles. So beautiful. It would make an awesome urbanist space, I agree. This is the house of William Morris in England. So this type of architecture, if you see in England, that's arts and crafts. It's kind of wonky and fairy tale like, at least in my opinion. I love the stonework as well. And let me show you two photos of how it looks like inside. So this is uh, the main altar. Lots of beautiful woodwork. The woodwork displays the beams. They never painted the wood. So the wood was original uh, color in order to emphasize where the wood came from. And they have put a lot of importance on very rare woods. They would use a lot of walnut. And here's another one. Closer look on the altar. Absolutely gorgeous. However, this church was a part of controversy only until a few years ago because there was a plaque right in front of this church a plaque memorializing one man who apparently planted this Norwegian maple tree or birch sorry my trees are not so good so if anyone can clarify it's definitely from Norway this plaque was from a man who would become a very controversial leader of a rebellion against his own country. He used to go to this base right here during the Mexican War. His name is Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee went on from being one of the victorious generals of the Mexican-American War to becoming the leader of the Confederacy fighting against the North in a rebellion to separate from the country. Robert E. Lee was a vestryman right over here. Now, I don't really want to memorialize this type of history, but I think it's important to know why we no longer see a plaque. Because there was a plaque, and it was installed here in the early 1900s by a group called the Daughters of the Confederacy. There was a secondary plaque also installed here because another major Confederate leader by the name of Stonewall Jackson was baptized right here. By pure coincidence, Stonewall Jackson ended up becoming the right-hand man of Robert E. Lee. Zoom many decades later, the Daughters of the Confederacy, which is this group of women who want to keep the memory of the Confederate alive, they installed plaques all around the United States of America and they also installed statues of major Confederate heroes or quote unquote heroes, depends on your view of history, all around the United States of America, including here and including for Hamilton, there's also a plaque from the Daughters of the Confederacy. But this is a bit controversial because First of all, they were putting plaques on things that were sometimes legend. No one really knows if Robert E. Lee even planted a tree. It's most likely a myth or a legend. He was a restroomman, but planting a tree, uh, I'm not really sure about that. The second thing is, they were putting a memorial of a rebel, a man who fought against the United States of America. They put a memorial here in New York a bit off place. Hence the complicated politics behind this and the complicated history as well. Because the Daughters of the Confederacy weren't really so fixated on real history. They were fixated more on the story of the Confederacy, the heroism that they wanted to depict. But a few years ago, those two plaques were removed. And when you see me raise up my camera, that means I'm putting up my, my, um, my mask on. This is Stonewall Jackson. He was a very devout Christian man. 
So devout, he frequently saw, said that he saw signs of Christianity, even in glasses of water. Uh, he was a very interesting man, a very uh, ruthless general. And this is uh, Robert E. Lee. And here's a story of the Lee tree. And this was from the Brooklyn Eagle. And apparently that was more myth. According to the Brooklyn Eagle, Robert E. Lee didn't actually plant this tree. It's a very interesting story. I'll post the, these photos later. And this is a photo of how the church looked like when it was first built. Let's go to our next stop. I'll show you a little bit more of the church on this side. And it's also nicknamed the Church of the Generals, but the only generals are really two Confederate generals. Here are a lot of single family housing all around this neighborhood. And just to clarify, the church was built in 1890. $2.9 million is the asking price. Thank you for letting us know, Jim. beautiful place. What's the name of the church called again? It's called St. John's Episcopal Church, though it's no longer a church. And uh, who knows what it will become. It might become a condo, it might become a house for someone. Who knows what it will become because it's currently for sale. I want to live in New York City at least once in my life. Oh, I hope you do, Natalie. It's definitely beautiful. And rents are going way, way down. And the reason for that is a lot of people are leaving New York, specifically Manhattan. Betty C says so interesting. Donald, I would I do agree with you. I love how prepared you are with slides, so much interesting info. No one does exactly what you do. Oh, thank you so much. There's a few other people who do uh, similar things to what I do. But I'm glad you think uh, I'm unique. All right, let's go to our next stop. So we're really crisscrossing through these neighborhoods. I'll be posting a map later so you know the stops. I want to clarify one thing about the Civil War. There's a lot of um, debate why the Civil War was fought and as far as from my research, I have done a lot of research into the Civil War because I covered much more Civil War history in these past few uh, weeks. It was fought for state rights. But the rights of the states, specifically the ones in the South, was the right to own slaves. So yes, it was fought for state rights, those rights being the ones to own slaves. And that's why there's always a confusion whether it was fought for slavery. The Union wasn't really fighting per se for slavery. It was just fighting per se to not give them the right to own slaves. Uh, and that's, that's why there's that confusion. And unfortunately, the Daughters of the Confederacy were involved in making textbooks all around the South. And they did omit the fact that they were wanting to keep slavery. 
uh, and it's a very complicated history. Oh, Watson, Watson, great question. Yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that. Uh, one thing to add was the church we saw standing there was built in the 1890s. Uh, however, there was a church there that stood before. This is the, like, the second version of the church. The first version was built much, much earlier, and that's the one that Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson attended. So thank you for clarifying. Thank you for uh, reminding me. I'll make cross over here in New York City. Why you make it so hard to cross the street? So a few people are asking me, um, Sean says, random, but what's your take on why people dislike Staten Island so much? I would say there's two reasons. One is, oh, beautiful Tudor style high rise. One is Staten Island is different culture. So Staten Island is pretty separated from the rest of New York. The main reason is the only two ways of getting to Staten Island is by taking the ferry service from downtown Manhattan all the way to St. George's Terminal, or you have to pay a very expensive toll to go across the Verrazano's Bridge, which does not have a walkway as far as I know. So yes, there is a freeway to get to Staten Island, but it's only one mode of transportation. And because there's only one mode of transportation, unlike Bronx and Queens, which has subways, free roads, walking, biking, etc., the culture has been very different. And you do sense a difference in culture. And with that, beyond that, there's very different political beliefs. So a lot of people in San Island tend to be much more conservative on many uh, social regards. So that might be two reasons why people might dislike Staten Island or might think it's different from New York. Great question, Sean. TD Bank is Canadian. Oh, thank you for letting us know. I didn't know TD Bank was Canadian. It was actually recently bought out by an American company called Charles Schwab. So I, I don't think the Canadians no longer own it, if I'm correct. Following real time on the map, what street are you on now, Patty? I'm on Shore Road currently. Ooh, look at this. Oh, here we are. This is our stuff. All right. So care, there, if you want to see a very good depiction of Staten Island and how it's different from New York, just uh, watch the episode of Staten Island on Sex and the City. That's a great example. There's a recent movie that came out, King of Staten Island, and that's another good example. There you'll get a little bit better idea of the difference between Staten Island and the rest of New York. Okay, here is Fort Font Bone Academy. Now, Bay Ridge, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. During the Gilded Age, was an optimal place to set up mansions. The reason for that is it was a gorgeous area. You had beautiful views of the Narrows, which is between Staten Island and 
Brooklyn. Now these views are not as beautiful because there is a massive highway, the Belt Parkway. But before the Belt Parkway was ever built, before this was crisscrossed with a bunch of highways, New York City's richest tycoons moved here and established massive mansions all along Shore Road, which is this road over here. One of those mansions was by an oil tycoon from Ohio who hired two architects and McNally brothers to build his mansion. However, he didn't seem to like it too much, so he moved away in five years and sold it to another man who was infamous in New York City. His name was Diamond Jim Brady. Diamond Jim Brady had a whole big love for diamonds and eating a lot of food. Many of the restaurants he frequented, people said he was the best customer because he would eat all the food. Diamond Jim Brady is also well known because he's the first New Yorker to own a car. But by being the first New Yorker to own a car, he was also a very lavish man, a very reckless man. So he was also the first New Yorker to have a traffic accident. Diamond Jim Brady had four wives, but during the late years of his life, it seemed that he kind of lost interest in pursuing women in a romantic sense, but he still pursued one particular woman in a platonic sense, lavishing her with gifts. Her name was Lillian Russell. He loved Lillian Russell so much, apparently platonically, not romantically, that he gifted her this house. So Lillian Russell lived here for many years until Diamond Jim Brady died and she had to uh, sell it off. Nowadays, this is a Catholic girls school. Let's take a look around. Thanks for the beautiful tour and the great history lessons. I am so happy. Thank you so much for watching. Susie, thank you. Let's go down here. I'm gonna wait for people to stop running out. That's quite a hairdo she had. It was very common. And if you notice, uh, Lenny and Russell was a more curvy a woman, very typical. Um, so who was Lillian Russell? It, she was a theater actress and one of the top ones. She was in 13 Broadway shows while she was involved with Diamond Jim Brady. And that was the typical look of a famous actress, you know, more curvy, big hair. Yes, Kay, you're right. She was an actress and I think she did silent film if I'm correct. She definitely was in Broadway. I think she did silent film. This was also built in 1890s. I think this more modern part for the Academy was built in the 30s. Now this is the only mansion that survives from Gilded Age Bay Ridge. There's no other major mansion. And why is that? Well, things changed. Bay Ridge became much more popular in the 1920s and 30s, especially after the BMT, which was the subway line, one of the three major subway lines in subway companies in New York City. They built a stop along Fourth Avenue. Let's go to our next stop. And we're gonna go up Shore Road, actually. Let's go up this way. I think this is the first stream I've been able to watch since you were in Paris. Oh, Sean, no worries. Thank you so much for tuning in again. I think you watched one or two others in, my, in the wintertime, if I'm correct. So here we see views of Staten Island, and we'll see better views soon. 
I guess they didn't have zoning laws here. They did. I'm not entirely sure of the history of zoning laws. That's a good question. There were definitely mansions and single unit family homes, but I think then they were rezoned to high rise residential. Sean says, hopefully one day when my fiance and I plan our visit to New York for the first time, we can chat with you about our must-see places. I'm more interested in your advice than any Google search. Yes, feel free to reach out to me. Ooh, look at that, everyone. This is the shore. Or if you're from Long Island, you would say shore. I think some Brooklynites might say shore too. Let's uh, actually walk along the shore. Oh, wow. We're gonna have a lot of beautiful architecture here. Lots of Tudor style architecture, which was all the rage back then. Hey friend, I'm so cool. So glad you live here. If you have any recommendations for food, let me know. Oh, look at this, everyone. Oh, this is quite a view. Especially with the haziness, it, look, it looks the it makes the Verrazano Bridge look more epic. Hello, Gwen. Nice to see you here. Could be I missed it. I want to make I went to make a sandwich, but why Stonewall? And is there a connection to today's gay, sto gay Stonewall? No, uh, Stonewall Tavern is named after a different Stonewall. I'm not entirely sure who's what Stonewall that is named after. I think there was also a general. Stonewall in in the north, but don't quote me on that. It was named after a different Stonewall, as far as I know. Look at that. What about the sharks in Long Island? Oh yes, they're returning. If anyone's seen the movie Jaws, it was shot, I think, in At Amityville, or it took place in Amityville. Either one of those two, and um, it's actually happening in real life. Yeah, 100% you got to come here for some photography. There was two women taking an Instagram photo right there. So, oh yeah, 100%. Let's go to our next stop. Walking distance here a little bit longer, so I think this might be a two-hour tour. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> and what happened to my executive producer? Uh, he's taking a, a vacation. He, he will be back at some point. We'll, we'll do another driving tour at some point. Stay tuned. Irene, great question. Donna, you haven't been in the water since watching Jaws. Oh, I can imagine. No cruise ships passing under the bridge during the pandemic. No cruise ships are nowhere to be seen, unfortunately. Let's cross over here. Oh, look at that. The streets are fairly clean, I agree. The park is not the cleanest, but the streets are. Oh yeah. So this neighborhood is much larger than I thought it would be. So we have another 
15 minutes to get to our location. Feel free to ask me any questions. Do you think there are communal gardens? Yes, there's one. Um, I wish I... No, that one is inaccessible, but there's a few. There's a few of them. There's one called Bar Barwell Terrace. And some of these high-rises high might have a co courtyard. Condos. These are apartments. I don't think people would call them condos. Though, I'm not 100% sure. My educated guess is that people are renting these and not necessarily buying them. Though, if anyone knows for sure, let me know in the comments. Hugh, welcome. Times have changed the Saturday Night Fever shots. They weren't shot here, so most of the film was actually shot in Bensonhurst. It takes place in Bay Ridge, but it was shot in Bensonhurst, which is the next neighborhood down. The rent? I'm not entirely sure. Good question. I'm not sure. It must be a little bit cheaper than Northern Brooklyn, like Williamsburg or Greenpoint. And definitely a little bit more expensive than Staten Island. But I'm not sure what that range is. Betty, was I born in New York? No, I was, I was born in Puerto Rico, which is an island in the Caribbean, a territory of the United States of America. I came here when I was an infant. So I do consider myself a native New Yorker because I've been here basically my entire life. How's the weather in New York? It's nice, it's sunny, and it's extremely hot. It's about 88 degrees Fahrenheit right now. I'm not sure what that is in Celsius. If anyone does, let me know. And let's turn. Nice balconies, I agree. And I think here we're gonna see a courtyard. Yes. So courtyard that fancy. Just in general, in New York, you don't see that many fancy courtyards. Maybe in neighborhoods like Forest Hills, Queens, or Jackson Heights, Queens, but I don't think they're so common in Brooklyn. Mr. Softy driving around these crazy times, they are by later in the afternoon. Usually at night. I don't want my kid working there because they'll the bowl, you know? So I tell her to stay outside. So what we're seeing is a population of 79,000 people live in this neighborhood. A lot of Italian American and Irish Americans. And there's more and more growing population of Arab Americans here. There's a certain avenue that's becoming Little Arabia. No central air. No, here in New York City, central air is not common. It's a lot of wall units in New York City. Uh, more modern condos, there is central air.
Sue, you were here two years ago on this date with your sister uh, and you were touring New York City. Can't wait to return. Well, I hope you do. Oh, look at this. Wow. M Myra, yes, we're going to the gingerbread house. That'll be our last stop. So stay tuned. We're, we're definitely going to the gingerbread house. But we're going to the monastery. Wait a minute, there's a monastery in the middle of New York? How is that even possible? Well, New York has changed. This monastery used to be in the middle of nowhere. Now it's in the middle of somewhere. Oh, the fire escape, the balconies of New York. That's the longest California roll I've ever seen saw in a car. Oh, what are you referring to, Emiliano? Okay, here we are. We are in what is this? A fortification. Is it a fort? Is it a a water reservoir? Is it a museum? Is it a jail? What is this? Well this, ladies and gentlemen is, as far as I know, the only monastery in Brooklyn. Monasteries are usually in mountaintops, mountain ranges, in the middle, basically of nowhere, because to live a monastic lifestyle of silence and deep meditation upon our Lord, you would need to do that You're generally in an empty place. It's much easier to do so, to be much more spiritual in in a nature landscape than it is to be in the middle of the city. But nonetheless, a monastery here was built. This is the Brooklyn Visitation Monastery and it is led by an order of nuns, which is here. Now, Our Lady of Mary order of nuns and they established here a all-girls school as well it's huge it's really huge so there is a seminary in Chelsea in New York City in Manhattan, but that is not a monastery, it's different. Seminaries are places to learn theology. Monasteries, yes, you do might learn theology, but you are practicing a monastic lifestyle of silence, of quietness, of stillness, and of deep religious introspection. And generally, that's why monasteries are built in places that are very remote. However, this one was built in a place that used to be very remote back in the 1800s. Look at that. So back in 1855, when this was built, there wasn't anything in Bay Ridge. It was fairly empty. However, things changed. 
as Bay Ridge was renamed, or as Yellow Hook was re renamed to Bay Ridge, and the Gilded Age tycoon started moving along Shore Road, a lot of saloons started opening up all around this neighborhood. Drunken, drunkenness became a huge nuisance upon this quiet neighborhood in Brooklyn. And thus, this order of nuns opened up a rehab center, but not in a typical way that you might think of rehab nowadays or Alcoholics Anonymous. This rehab was more similar to a monastic lifestyle. They really didn't have too much scientific methods to cure alcoholism, but they used moral methods. So this is built also in the Spanish Mediterranean style, or some, some people might call it the mission style, if I'm correct. And yeah, it's very peaceful. And there's a woman in front praying on the rosary. Let me put my volume down. And look how gorgeous this is. Private property. Let's zoom in here. So it looks a lot like the churches of Santa Maria's that we saw in Rome as well. Beautiful. And then in the 1890s, they, the Order of Nuns uh, set, um, downsized and they opened up a all-girls school. So it's nursery through grade eight. Oh, look at that. However, there's another cool thing about this monastery. If I think, I think it's only open to women. If you are a woman who wants to experience monastic life for a weekend, they have uh, this program where you sign up, you stay here for a weekend. I think sometimes you can stay maybe for a week and experience true monastic life of silence, of stillness, of deep introspection upon our spiritual selves. Beautiful. Okay, everyone, we have two more stops. Let's go. Are you ready? Are you hyped? for these last two stops in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. We've experienced a monastery, a Gilded Age mansion, a church of generals, a huge massive cannonball. Phil, you would sign up. Yes, I mean, um, monastic life. Seems very interesting. I'm very curious into visiting the monasteries that are really remote. Uh, I would love to one day go to these monasteries that are deep into the German Alps or the Swiss Alps. I think that would be really awesome to explore and try their beer because the monks do make beer in those areas of Europe. And we're actually going to turn here and go one more block down. No beer for me. Oh, no, Phil. <laughs> I don't think monastic life would be complete without a beer. Brooklyn Visitation Monastery. That's the name 
of this massive monastery in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. So we're getting a lot of comments. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in. Uh, what's the name of the monster? We said that Emiliano, which is also beer, but fruity flavored. What street am I on? You know, to be honest, I have no idea, but I'll be posting a map of the stops I visited and the addresses. Kind of just following the directions, but I don't know the street. I'll tell you when I crisscross it. David, you said, P.S. One day I saw a church from 1704 or something, kind of pink looking with a roof eave struts all around. This is when I started realizing how very old things are compared to the West Coast. I saw a church from 1704. Where was this? I'm very curious. There's, there's very few buildings here that predate even 1835 in New York City, period. Uh, so I'm very curious where you saw that. But yes, there are a lot of old things. In Manhattan, not many buildings pre-1835. There's, there's two or three. Or there might be a few more, actually. Maybe a dozen. Here, there might be a little bit more. Have you got water? your water with you? Oh, yes, I got two frozen bottles of water. I'm at 89th Street. Thank you for letting us know. 89th Street. 89th and Colonial Road. I'm going to take one more block and turn to our last two stops. How many do you see wearing masks, Emiliano? It depends. On, in the city, I see a lot more people wearing a mask. Uh, I mean, uh, Manhattan. In, here in Brooklyn, a lot less people. And I think it's because it's a quiet suburban area. Well, suburban. Not suburban, but it is a more residential area. Patricia, thank you so much for putting in the link. You must try the mead. Ooh, yes, I've tried mead before. Not from monks. I've just tried mead in general, and I love it. Actually, I did try a mead from a monk. It was in Estonia, Tallinn, Estonia. And I went to a restaurant called Old Hansa that had mead uh, made from one of the monks' monasteries nearby. The gardens are gorgeous, I agree. David, say I started watching, looking for Action Kid Live uh, and got you subscribed. Let's have a peek. Thanks for your work too from Sandy Point. Oh, thank you so much for David. I appreciate you watching. Seven and a half acres was the monastery. Thank you for letting us know, Linda. And which church owns that? I think it's Catholic. I think it's Catholic. Yes, it should be Catholic, the monastery. Roman Catholic, to be precise. Sometimes when I use the term Catholic, I think uh, I'm generally referring to Roman Catholic because uh, we're here in the United States. But there are two, about, I think, two or three other Catholics. Uh, one of them, I think, is from Egypt. Uh, however, you really won't see those type of Catholics here in the U.S. So uh, just, just one, one caveat. Look at this little street. What is this? This is not part of my stop. Uh, we just bumped into this beautiful cobblestone street of Tudor houses. Wow. Look at this. Are you on the bike while filming this? No, Virginia, no, I'm not on the bike. I am using my two feet. Why, why would you think I'm on a bike? I'm strolling, quiet, I'm slowly strolling through Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Wow. 
Gwen, are these Tudor? Uh, to me, they look like Tudor, but let me know. Are they different? Uh, they might be, go through a different name. Look, please clarify. I usually asso associate these kind of triangular shapes with Tudor, but they might be something else. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Wow. Dutch, Dutch church, maybe. I'll try to be quick to listen, slow to speak more. I remember your dad saying hi. Hey, David, yeah. Um, oh, yes, I think you might be referring to the... We visited a church in uptown, in upstate New York, Sleepy Hollow. And that is definitely uh, from 1699. So we, we visited a few old Dutch churches. Silent. Okay, yes. The street name is Shore S Center? CT. What is CT short, so, short for? David, thank you so much for the shoot super chat. I really appreciate it. Oh, awesome. David left me a super chat. Thank you so much, David, and to all the other people who left me stars on Facebook. This helps support the show so I can keep making more videos like this and keep escalating how I bring you more better quality so shore ct and 89th street but i don't know what ct stands for if anyone knows let me know in the comments what does ct stand for it might be center center but i'm not sure court yeah might be court i think it's probably court that makes the most amount of sense so shore court and 89th street Marguerite, have I done the tour of the Rockways? Yes, I have. Check it out. It was about a month ago. Awesome tour. We covered a lot of awesome history. We saw the beach. We did all the things. <laughs> Natalie, I was teasing about why you thought I was on a bike. Uh, yes, I am on foot. I don't do tours on bike. I, I barely ride a bike myself. I haven't done so in years. The reason I was teasing is because um, in these tours, especially since I'm walking through a, such a big neighborhood, I tend to speed walk. So I walk like a real New Yorker, <laughs> which I am, and I walk crazy fast. So yeah, uh, some uh, K and a few others, especially from UK, have said that I don't stroll, I gallop. And yeah, it's pretty much accurate. Wow, I just, I love the architecture here. Really just blown away. I did not expect to see that this much beautiful architecture. Okay, uh, Phil, he says you might lose your mask. Yes, yes, that's a good, good point. Linda says, thanks for masking up. Yes, if you see me taking off my mask, it's because there's usually never nobody around me. Uh, but I am choosing to wear a mask, especially when people are nearby. Here's Narrows Avenue and 88th Street, and we're walking up Narrows Avenue. I ran around here as a kid. How I miss Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. George would love this architecture today. Yes. I haven't seen George on in a while. My favorite location, my daughter used to swim at 
was Fort Hamilton High School. And that is precisely our next stop, Fernando. So cool. Angie, thank you so much for the stars. I appreciate it. Okay, everyone, I gotta take a water break. I'm gonna put the camera down. If you saw me crossing the street, the reason for that is, was because there was a man right there walking without a mask and coughing. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why he was doing that. People are weird during this pandemic. Oh, New York City bus. This is the B-16. Where art thou, old traveler? We are still walking on Bay Ridge. Bay Ridge is a big neighborhood. 79,000 people living here. To walk from side to side is about 45 minutes, maybe a little bit more. Fernando, no, not Diker Heights today. We're sticking just to Bay Ridge. Do you think it will be safe in the fall? Yes, 100%. Uh, maybe not the park. In the park, I would recommend not going late at night. It doesn't look so friendly to go at night. But during the daytime, the park and the neighborhood are awesome. And I think at night you'll be okay here. However, one thing you should know about exploring residential neighborhoods at night is that you're not going to see much because unlike a city like Paris, there's not that much street lighting. So I would recommend coming to these neighborhoods during the daytime. Any time of year is okay. And yes, you'll be safe. Irene says, not only in the pandemic. Yes, it's weird when people like coughing right behind you. So it's very weird. I agree. Those Tudor town uh, homes sell for $1.3 million, Cindy. Whoa. Uh, and we're about to see a house that goes for much higher than that. 11 to $20 million. Pudding Plays, you've been binging my series, really enjoying it. Any good places to eat in Little Italy? My top Little Italy pick is the pizza, uh, Ruby Rosa, which is a pizzeria restaurant. And it is absolutely delicious. Highly recommend trying it. They sell a heart-shaped pizza and they also sell a vodka, the best vodka slice you ever have. So Ruby Rosa. Now, this is Fort Hamilton High School. You know what? I'm going to cross through here. I don't see any sign, so I'm going to go right ahead. Here is Fort Hamilton High School. It was built in 1941, but before this ever was in high school, this was one of the most popular sporting clubs and one of the most important in the nation. This was the Crescent Athletic Club and they had a massive boathouse right in front of this, what used to be this building. Actually, this is not the boathouse. Wrong picture, right there. This is the boathouse. The Crescent Athletic Club was 
A club of various Ivy League schools, they got together and played American football. However, this was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and thus American football was in, in its infancy. The version of American football we know today only developed around the 1930s when most rules were agreed upon. And the NFL was created a little bit later than that. So these guys were innovators, and you can imagine that they were playing the early version of American football that had a football that was more kind of rounder, rather than the football like this. It was like round. They were playing right over here, and it was, to them, it was a mixing up of soccer and rugby. And that was the inception of American football. There's a George Clooney movie. I don't know what the name is, but there's a George Clooney movie about it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our final stop is probably one of the coolest houses you'll see in New York City. Uh, at least I think so. And the reason for that is it's a type of architecture Again, that we rarely see in New York, but just by luck of being in this neighborhood, we're seeing two examples of arts and crafts. We saw St. John's Episcopal Church, and now we are at the Gingerbread House. Leatherheads is the movie. Thank you so much for letting us know, Donald. Leatherheads, if you all see a movie about early football history, Check that movie out. Nally, yes, you're right. It's rugby football with pads. <laughs> That's what the English say, or the people from the UK uh, say. It's a uh, it's it's a uh, rugby with a little bit more padding. <laughs> I would I don't want to get into that argument. This is not a church. This is a mansion. Built by for Howard and Jesse Jones. The Joneses wanted to make a house that was very unique. They wanted to stick out. So they hired one very talented architect by the name of James Sarlesfield Kennedy. And James Sarlesfield Kennedy designed mostly in the Tudor style, but he started putting his eye on the arts and crafts movement that was happening in the UK. Look how gorgeous it is. So this was finished construction in 1920. And uh, Joneses were shipping tycoons. And when they moved here, they were in utter awe. And I don't blame them. Because the interesting thing about Bay Ridge is that it's a very hilly area of New York. I'm using the term hills, though, though they're technically like glacial ridges and other things that uh, are a little bit more elevated than the rest of the landscape. So it's not even terrain, not flat land, uh, like a little bit further down into Brooklyn. This is very hilly, and they build the house to conform to the hills. And we're, we're going to do a full 360 because this is really cool. Uh, but let me show you the back side first. Well, we can't see too much of it. So here we see the backyard. Cool thing about the backyard is that it was built in different elevations. So right there where I'm pointing the camera is a patio right along the kitchen. Is it still private residence? Yes, and it's sold for a whole lot of money. Uh, I think it's anywhere between 11 to $20 million. Uh, one more thing, here's uh, Fort Hamilton, just a little bit more on the side, and that's the swimming pool. All right, let's check this house a little bit more. Now, also arts and crafts didn't cut their stones. So they use natural stones. And since we can get close to the house, well, I'll show you through the column over here. This is what the house is. The house is made of these types of rocks. A little bit more neatly uh, placed in the house, but you get the idea. These stones have natural shapes. They're not cut. 
Now, John Ruskin, who was one of the founders of the arts and crafts movement, was also an influential travel writer because he was one of the first people to write a travel guide. And uh, when I've learned about his history, I mentioned him in the very early years when I started Urbanist uh, because he had a philosophy of travel, John Ruskin, who said that when you travel, rather than just kind of look at the places and just walk from spot to spot, stop and take it all in. Breathe and kind of just admire a single detail. Maybe admire just the chimney that looks straight out of a Hansel and Gretel fairy tale, hence the name the gingerbread house. And John Ruskin traveled all around Europe, specifically to places like Paris, Italy, and wrote travel guides. And also admired a lot of the architecture in these different places, and it fed into this arts and crafts movement, with, which took a lot of ideas from all different architectural styles, but focused on the unique craftsmanship of each person. Let's go around. Is it a brick roof? Ooh, I'm not sure. But look at this. So the cool thing is it has these windows that look like eyelids. Now the gingerbread house is not the official name. That was the name given by the community who said it looked like a gingerbread house because it kind of does. It looks like the house that is in the Hensel and Gretel fairy tale. This is a house I would move into. I love this architectural style and I cannot wait to go to England and see more of these. Uh, two other people who were involved in the arts and crafts movement were Oscar Wilde, who I think had a lot of decorations and furniture from this movement, and also Frank Lloyd Wright the famous American architect. He drew a lot of inspiration from this movement. Joanne, I don't know about the Mushroom House. Um, yeah, haven't heard about it. Don't know. Let me know where you're referring to. So there's craftsman details in every single aspect of this house, including the cast iron fixtures on the front. Now, when you see these, these are also arts and crafts inspired. It looks like some kind of slate. I think it is slate, yes, it is slate. Beautiful. I can't make out the material. It is slate, I think, or, or uh, tile. I'm not entirely sure. If anyone knows, let us know. The furniture inside is also made out of, out of arts and crafts. stylings, wood that's not painted, made out of unique woods like walnut. You'll see the connection of the beams as well. I think uh, I'll show you a little bit more around. Here's the backyard. Can I have it, the house? <laughs> David, I'm wondering the same thing. And look, it looks like a face. He's, he's, he's pr pretty uh, straight-faced. Magnificent. Is it a private home? Yes, it is. Uh, I think it was bought just last year. I wish I could post photos of it. Uh, however, I will link to an article that has photos of the interiors but I don't own the rights to those photos and hence that's why I can't post them.
And look, they used a lot of wood to cover the, the garage and make it a little bit more private. It looks like a frog face, <laughs> says Darren. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's someone living here. There's a car parked in front. And they seem to be a... I can't tell if that's a Republican or, or Democrat, but they're supporting a woman named Nicole Maliotakis. Sounds Greek, Maliotakis. They're also known as Story Brook Houses. Yes, Jim, that is the other name. Storybrook House, but I think Storybrook House has uh, it's it's a bit of a different lineage of, of architectural architect architectural history. I think uh, Storybrook might be a little bit more fantastical, though I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, I know that this it might look fantastical, but not all arts and crafts houses are this fantastical so much character i agree i agree let's let's see if we can see more of the backyard so a lot of houses more modern suburbs i i visited last week um, a neighborhood that was close to where i'm currently living which is valley stream and that doesn't have too much character the houses but what i like about these type of houses not to be nostalgic about the past but they have character and i think that's a very good astute observation i think that character uh you get a feeling that this house is 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 living it's an organic thing asphalt shingle roofs as cindy Ooh, i think that might be the one Massive backyard, too. And this is a major landmark for people who love architecture. So I, I assume I'm not the only one who has passed by here taking photos or video. No pool, no, no pool. Though I wonder what a arts and crafts style pool would look like. I dare you to go up and knock. No, I would not do that. Especially on camera. In general, maybe, but not, not on camera. <laughs> Look at this house. It also looks like a face in the front. Okay, so that was our last stop. Uh, however, I want to show you the views of the Verrazano. So we see a beautiful view over here of the Narrows to give you a little bit more of a sense of the geography of where we just walked through. It probably would look like a pond. I agree, David. Uh, an arts and crafts style pool would look like a fairy tale pond. Like you see in uh, these paintings of Greek legends, myths that were adapted to 18th century paintings. And me and my dad are uh, likely to drive around again, except not in 360. Uh, so yes, I, I might be doing another driving tour soon. Maybe of Staten Island. So here we are, we're going right here. Yeah, this is the place. Where, what would you recommend I get for lunch while watching the stream? Like this live stream, what you would get for lunch? 
Well, you are in the UK. If I were you watching from the UK, I would get myself a cream tea. <laughs> to be honest, maybe a sausage roll. Uh, but that's just me because I just love my cream tea and my sausage rolls if I were in the UK. But if you want to be really New Yorker, grab yourself a bagel with uh, salmon and cream cheese. Max, you say awesome place. I do like the shapes, the topery of the tiny trees in all the gardens. And bagels, I vote. Jam first mine. <laughs> Cornish style. <laughs> Don't say that to anyone from Devonshire. Here's more of Fort Hamilton High School from the back. And here we're going to Port Point Lookout which isn't the best kept park, but it'll give you a sense of Staten Island. And one final story. Actually, this is the real final stop. I got a little bit too ahead of myself. This is the official final stop because I have one more story for all of you. Does anyone want to listen to this one final story? One story that will blow your mind to how New York City could have been completely different in the 1900s. If you do, press that heart button and also put orange heart emojis in the comments. And I'm surrounded by dragonflies. This is quite magical. The, ca the camera doesn't really capture it, but there's dragonflies all around me right now. This is amazing. <laughs> so cool. Oh, wow. Oscar, you love my content. Oh, thank you, Oscar. I'm surrounded by dragonflies. This is, this is just magical. Okay, everyone. Right now, we are at the Shore Row Park and we're facing the Belt Parkway. Belt Parkway is a massive uh, road system that goes all around Brooklyn and Queens and connects to major roadways like the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which was built by Robert Moses and Otmar Edman Aman. Here's a photo of them. Otmar Edman Aman was the architect. He was a Swiss architect, very famous right there. And Robert Moses is the one right here. And he was the master builder of New York City. Here's a photo of it being constructed. However, one thing happened. Robert Moses, when he was building the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, and basically all of New York, because he was the master builder of New York, he absolutely hated public transportation. Robert Moses was known to be a racist man, not due to interpretation, but due to, due to many direct quotes from him that were publicly said on television and his writings and newspaper interviews. And thus he saw public transportation as a gateway for the lower classes to propagate through the cities. He didn't want that. He wanted to clear the lower classes, kind of isolate them. And when he was approached to making the Verrazano's Bridge, he wanted to build the bridge because the bridge was a big show of power. But two things, he could build it as roads only and he could impose a toll. But he didn't choose to pursue one project that was already being built. Back in 1923, Henry, Harry Murphy, Henry C. Murphy, my mistake, Henry C. Murphy, who was an American senator. Before that, he was a mayor. He was a statesman. He was a, a bunch of other things. He ended up breaking ground. Actually, I'm getting myself confused. Sorry, everyone. Wrong person. Mayor Highland was the person. Mayor Highland, similar name. Mayor Highland broke ground here in 1923 to build a huge subway tunnel that would connect Brooklyn to Staten Island. This subway tunnel is depicted in this subway map right over here. 
of the BMT line. It would have been an extension that connected to the 4th Avenue line that runs currently along Bay Ridge. However, in 1925, they needed more funding and they were trying to find other ways of funding. It never panned out and they never built this subway tunnel. Talk started again in the 1930s. However, no one really wanted to build it either. By the 1960s, when they were also again looking into building a tunnel that would connect New York City's subway system with Staten Island that might have changed the complete fabric of Staten Island as we know it, because Staten Island right now, as I mentioned, due to its separation, has a very different culture from what we know here in New York. That might have been completely different if they actually built the subway line. But by then, we had Robert Moses, a man who hated subways who hated public transportation, and who built the Verrazano Bridge without a toll, I mean, without a, walkie, a walkway, a bike path, or any mass transit. It was f fully for cars and with a very expensive toll. Thus, the Staten Island subway was never built. However, us walking right above this park, we might be walking right above the very tunnels that still lie underneath our feet, waiting to be completed, connecting finally all five boroughs of New York by subway. Hopefully that will happen one day. Thank you everyone so much for watching. I'm Ariel with Urbanists. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Stay tuned every Saturday and Wednesdays I do live videos on Facebook and on YouTube. And you might be seeing a bonus live video right after this on the ferry. That would be about an hour or two from this time. Have a great day, everyone. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring.